This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's a New Year's resolution or a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their wonderful all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Following hot on the heels of the seemingly endless Brexit squabbling comes another project lathered in controversy. Now, right at the beginning of Mega Projects, we did a video on London's new Crossrail Underground Line. It was a project big on ambition and grandeur, but it was also mired in development issues and one that is still not finished. But if you thought that was the biggest rail venture going on in the UK, well, think again, because welcome to High Speed 2. The name High Speed 2 feels like it's already been around forever. Indeed, as a British person, I'm like, High Speed 2, that's not finished yet, really? But construction has only actually just begun. The High Speed Rail Link service will initially link London and Birmingham before separating and continuing north to Manchester and Leeds. The Manchester branch will also have an offshoot terminating near Wigan. The first phase is due to be completed between 2028 and 2030, while the northern sections are scheduled to be open somewhere between 2035 and 2040. I'll be over 50 years old when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's somewhat depressing. So we're going to be talking about High Speed 2 for a little bit of a while. Not in today's video, I just mean in the general discourse of a society. This is a truly monumental project that has already seen its estimated cost balloon to truly stratospheric levels and one that has courted significant controversy up and down the country. This could well be the UK's defining mega project of the 21st century. In comparison with some other countries around the world, Britain is far behind in terms of high-speed rail travel. The most famous, of course, is the Japanese Shinkansen trains, now capable of traveling at speeds of 360 km an hour, it's 223 miles per hour. In Europe, France, Italy, Spain, and Germany all use high-speed trains that have been in place for a long time. In Britain, high-speed rail has always been a bit of a difficult journey. Traditionally one of the leaders in terms of rail innovation, the country has slipped noticeably down the pecking order over the last 50 years. During the 1970s, the advanced passenger train was trialled in the UK, capable of speeds up to 249 kilometers an hour, that's 155 miles per hour. However, it ran into financial problems that were compounded by the negative media coverage focusing on the train's design faults, and it was finally scrapped in 1987. Instead, the UK built and extended motorways around the country. In 1960, the total length of motorways in Britain was 95 miles. As of 2019, that figure has reached 2,320 miles. Miles. The average vehicle flow across the two periods also increased by nearly nine times. The UK just became much more of a car nation, and sadly, rail services just began falling behind. If you were already wondering about High Speed 1, then here we are. The first high speed rail line in the UK opened fully in 2007 and runs for 108 kilometers, 67 miles between London and the Channel Tunnel, which in case you missed it is a rail tunnel which passes under the English Channel, connecting the UK with France. At a cost of 5.8 billion pounds, it certainly didn't come cheap, but it pales in comparison to the absolutely astronomical figures we're going to be coming to shortly. This was an important line because it finally put the British section on par with their Gaelic cousins. Before this, trains had travelled from Paris to the Channel Tunnel at speeds of up to 300 km an hour, but coming out of the tunnel in the UK, trains could only travel at a maximum speed of 160 km an hour. For a nation who invented rail travel, this was a, a little bit galling. It was only two years after the full opening of High Speed 1 that murmurs of another, longer High Speed Rail line began to emerge. Initially, the proposal came from the Labour Party, then in power, but it was supported by the Conservative and Liberal Democrat coalition, which came into power in 2010. The initial Y-shaped design, which we mentioned at the beginning of the video, has not changed much, but the design has undergone slight alterations to mitigate the ecological impact. The government hopes that High Speed 2 will increase capacity on British railways, weaning the country from from air and road to rail. It is hoped that by adding high-speed connections between the major cities, it would free up space on other lines which could then operate slower local routes and freight services. Then there was the argument that seems forever danced around in the UK. 
the North-South Divide. London is not only the largest city in the UK by far, but has also attracted significantly more investment than anywhere else. Everything from average income, life expectancy, house prices, and unemployment have all traditionally been skewed along the North-South Divide. Those in the North have felt left behind for decades, and now it's difficult to argue with that sentiment. A new high-speed rail line connecting the North and South was seen as the start of a leveling up process within the country, to borrow a phrase from Prime Minister Boris Johnson, which hopefully would see rising investment away from the bright lights of London. In 2010, the estimated cost for the entire project was between £30.9 billion and £36 billion, but things were still a long way from getting started. Between 2010 and 2019, the UK went through a truly tumultuous period. The referendum on leaving the European Union spilt over into bickering, protests, and at times, open contempt. It was not a particularly pleasant time for the country, and one in which the debate over High Speed 2 exploded. The opposition to High Speed 2 has been fierce, with much of it centering around the environmental impact that the line will have. The Woodland Trust, the UK's largest woodland conservation group, has stated that 108 ancient woodlands will be affected by the railways, with a whole catalogue of rare animals set to lose their habitat. Others argue it's simply a waste of money and that the UK doesn't need a high-speed rail network. With the NHS often struggling badly for funding, it's not hard to find other causes that could benefit from the money. And not to get too far ahead of ourselves here, but that estimate estimated cost I just gave you, well, that's already got up considerably. It wasn't quite stratospheric enough. It's a project that has divided many in politics as well, although the three largest political parties, the Conservatives, Labour and Liberal Democrats, now do support it. The Green Party, Brexit Party and UK Independence Party oppose the project, but hold so little power in Parliament they haven't managed to provide much political opposition. Then there is the awkward question of CO2 emissions. You would think that by installing high-speed railways that the UK would reduce CO2 emissions, but it's not quite that straightforward. A government white paper published in 2007 stated that trains that travel at a speed of 350 km an hour, 220 miles per hour, use 90% more energy than at 200 km per hour, 125 miles per hour, which would result in carbon emissions for a London to Edinburgh journey of approximately 14 kg per passenger for high-speed rail compared to 7 kg per passenger for conventional rail. Air travel emits 26 kg per passenger for the same journey. So with it's certainly better than an aircraft, but perhaps not quite as green as you would imagine. However, the paper also added that a switch to carbon-free or carbon-neutral energy production would make a huge difference, obviously. In 2010, the government said that the project would be, and I quote, roughly carbon-neutral, which is about as non-committal as you can possibly get, politicians. A statement by High Speed 2 has said that the construction of Phase 1 will lead to roughly 5.8 to 6.2 million tons of carbon carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, but after which it will be carbon neutral and by 2030 emissions are estimated to be 8 grams for high-speed rail, 22 grams for conventional intercity rail, 67 grams for private car transport and 170 grams for domestic aviation per passenger. It has given high-speed rail the green signal. All of this opposition built up steadily over the years, so much so that the government ordered a full review of the project in 2019. At the time, preparation work for phase one had already begun and continued through the inquiry. Though the review was completed by the end of 2019, the findings were delayed because of the general election in December. In February 2020, the Okavi review was finally published, concluding that High Speed 2 should go ahead with certain alterations, much of it relating to the spiraling costs. High Speed 2 had its final go-ahead. And if you want your new website to earn a well-deserved green light, well, you've got to think about doing it with Squarespace. Look, we are rapidly approaching a new year, so whatever that thing you're thinking of doing is, well, it's time to do it with Squarespace. Squarespace is the platform to use if you want to get started on that web project you're thinking about. If you're thinking about getting in and out real quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like, use one of their beautiful templates to make a website that is fresh for you super easy to get done. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person, you've got opinions about what you want your site to look like, really down to all of the nitty-gritty details. Well, Squarespace gives you tons of customization options to make it look amazing. And there's no updates with Squarespace, no patches, no technical BS to deal with. And once you're done setting up your website, you know, tinkering with the design if you want, changing the colors, all of that stuff, there's tons of extra features 
features that you can also integrate. Email campaigns, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, everything you need in one beautiful place. And look, this isn't just another advertiser partnership for me. The Mega Projects website at megaprojects.net was built entirely on Squarespace, and I have no design skills. I'm still like, that looks pretty good. Squarespace made it easy. When you're ready to get started on your next big project or small project, whatever you like, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash mega projects and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back into it. As I mentioned right at the start of this video, High Speed 2 will take a Y-shaped form reaching from London to the north of England. To make matters slightly more complicated, High Speed trains will also begin operating on routes that are not technically High Speed 2, but have been modified. The first line to be constructed will be the section from London to Birmingham, which will include four stations. London Euston, Old Oak Common, an interchange just outside of London, Birmingham Curzon Street, and Birmingham Interchange outside the city. The route will be in the region of 160 kilometers long and is expected to take 45 minutes. The current journey time is at least one hour and 22 minutes. Coming out of London, the train will travel through two tunnels before reaching the M25, the ringed motorway which wraps around London, one 13 kilometers and the other 15.8 kilometers. Outside of the M25, it will continue north and include a green tunnel, a carton cover tunnel where a shallow ditch is dug and then covered over with natural elements, in theory making it more aesthetically pleasing. The new Birmingham Interchange station will be situated near the small town of Solihull, around 14.4 kilometers southeast of Birmingham, and it's here that Phase 1 will make its second scheduled stop before continuing into Britain's second largest city. But that's not quite it for Phase 1. The line is due to terminate near Litchfield, north of Birmingham, where it will eventually merge into Phase 2. Phase 2 is a little more complex, but it can be broken down into Phase 2A and Phase 2B, but even then, it's still not quite so simple. The phases denote the construction process rather than the actual line. So the western line from Birmingham starts with a section of Phase 2A and then morphs into Phase 2B. Phase 2A will connect Litchfield and Crewe, which will act as a gateway to both Manchester and Liverpool. Liverpool has not been included on the High Speed 2 lines, but will be connected to it via an existing freight line and will service high speed trains. Crewe is set to see a major upgrade to its existing main station and will also include a tunnel beneath it, allowing trains not stopping in crew to go under it without needing to reduce speed. From crew, Phase 2B will travel north and break into a Y shape, with the western section terminating near Wigan and the eastern continuing to Manchester Airport, then Manchester itself, through a newly constructed 16km tunnel. The second section of Phase 2B will begin just outside of Birmingham at Coles Hill. From there, it continues northeast to a newly built station called the East Midlands Hub near Derby. At this point, the High Speed 2 line will continue north to Leeds, where a Midland main line will run parallel to it from the East Midlands hub up to Sheffield. Once again, this is not an official section of High Speed 2, but it will use high speed trains. Needless to say, the most significant change that passengers will experience will be travel times. A journey from London to Manchester will be reduced from 2 hours and 7 minutes to 1 hour and 40 minutes. And if you want to go even longer, London to Edinburgh will take 3 hours and 48 minutes rather than 4 hours and 22 minutes. I've used two examples from London, but the entire country will see reduced times between connecting cities. The number of people using the train services is also anticipated to grow quickly. High Speed 2 is expected to carry 26,000 people every hour and 86 million million passengers annually. London Euston is going to see a massive increase in both passengers and trains, with an estimated 15 trains either arriving or departing the London station every hour. During peak hours, Euston will see its commuter capacity more than treble after the introduction of High Speed 2. Speaking of Euston, and changing topics slightly, work around the busy London station has already included the removal of 40,000 skeletons from St. James's Church graveyard nearby, one of which was found to be the long-lost remains of Matthew Flinders, who 
led the first inshore circumnavigation of Australia, by the way. His remains are now going to be reburied in his hometown of Donington in Lincolnshire. The site of the expanded Birmingham Curzon Station has also unearthed some 6,500 skeletons from a nearby burial site, as well as the remnants of the world's oldest roundhouse, a large turntable that was used to turn locomotives, dating around 1837. The situation with the trains, or rolling stock as they say in the business, is also a bit of a complicated matter. The bidding process began in 2017 and was expected to have been awarded last year, but that has now been pushed back to the first quarter of 2021. But what do we know about the trains that will operate on High Speed 2? It's thought that the first batch purchased will number at least 54 individual trains with a maximum speed of at least 360 km an hour and measuring roughly 200 meters. It's also hoped that that the trains will be able to operate on both the new high-speed lines but also on most existing routes. However, this does come with a bit of a dilemma. Almost all high-speed trains built in Europe operate on a larger structure gauge than in the UK, meaning the minimum height and width of the tunnels and bridges are different, making the trains larger than what is normally seen in the UK. Purchasing custom-built trains to fit the UK network will likely cost nearly 50% more than the off-the-shelf options. One estimate states a specially designed train would cost £40 million rather than the £27 million it would cost to buy something similar which is used across Europe. So it seems that either the UK will have to stump up significantly more money to purchase trains that can be used all over the UK, or go for cheaper options that would be constricted to high-speed two lines and other routes that have been modified. Okay, so now we come to the massive white elephant sitting in the corner of the room. The cost of High Speed 2 has exploded since 2010, when, if you remember, the estimate was between £30.9 billion and £36 billion. It's already an insane amount of money. Well, in just 10 years, that figure has more than tripled. Officially, it currently stands at £98 billion pounds, although some involved with the Okavi review contend that it could be much higher than that, perhaps as much as 170 billion. This staggering increase has been attributed to several factors. Inflation, population density, cost of land, and the fact that High Speed 2 needs to travel into city centers. And if we've learned anything from the elusive Crossrail project, building new train lines through London is an absolutely hugely costly nightmare. At the same time, we do need to take into consideration the cost-benefit ratio. Yes, this is going to be a very costly endeavor to construct, but it is expected to produce net benefits and additional revenue. The Net benefits can be a little vague, but are likely to include the economic stimulation for towns and cities along the line, as well as an increased freight capacity, which should, in theory, lower costs. A few years ago, the ratio was estimated to be 2.30, meaning £2.30 of benefits for every £1 spent. However, this figure is now believed to have fallen to around £1.50. Not quite as attractive, but if correct, it would still be beneficial in the long run. Then there's the cost of operation. The estimated running costs of High Speed 2 are £3.90 per thousand meters for a 200 meter train and £5 for 260 meter trains. In comparison, the existing network costs £2 per thousand meters for 200 meter trains and £2.60 for the longer trains. After all the waiting, scrutinizing, and protesting, it seems that High Speed 2 is finally going ahead. That's not to say that the debate over it has calmed, far from it in fact, but the government appears increasingly committed to the project, and as work begins, it's difficult to see a last-minute change of mind. This will be one of the largest, most significant infrastructure projects the UK has seen in living memory. Considering the nation will need to contend with the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, a brand new recession, and the messy divorce from Europe, it certainly hasn't come at the best time. But then again, is there ever a right time for something quite like this? So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace. If you're thinking, Simon, you're wearing a great t-shirt, well, go to megamerch.co and you can buy one for yourself. And thank you for watching.